So my name is Matt Craig. I've got a small family custom cabinet shop up in Blaine, Minnesota. I'm the past president of the Cabinet Makers Association. I was asked to come and introduce John and say a few things about robot. Um, basically, that's the intro. Get a little closer here. Um, so basically, much like many of you, I've got employees. I want a robot. <laughs> I mean, what else can I say? Um, trying to figure out the next step. So I'm, I'm in it just as much as you guys. I've been researching it. Um, my predictions on this, I think if you look back at the early adopters of the CNC's, did anybody have a CNC back in the 80s, 90s? Okay. Um, and then the 2000s? So you kind of get the idea. Um, the people that got into it early, the first one we had was a DOS, little point-to-point -point machine, and it was funny now. Now I wish I had it back so I could rework it to control on it. But basically the early adopters of this stuff are gonna be the market leaders, and typically it is the larger multi-million dollar shops that are gonna do it. But I think as this stuff comes down into the smaller shops, you're gonna see them become highly competitive with the larger ones. Um, I think I'm gonna turn it over to John quicker than I planned to. I kind of feel like after talking with him and going through this and even going by their booth this morning, my robotics knowledge kind of ends with the ones they used to sell at Radio Shack. So um, I met John through a friend a few years ago, a uh, fantastic guy. His depth of knowledge never ceases to amaze me. It just keeps going deeper and deeper. So um, if you get a chance, have a conversation with him, he'll rock your world. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to John Park from SCM. Thanks, Matt. So, uh, as Matt uh, said, I'm, uh, my name is John Park. I'm VP of Engineering for uh, SCM. We have a little booth uh, on, in the B Hall. And I'm going to talk about both hard automation today and uh, robotic or soft automation. So, typically, we define hard automation as, as like these flexible storage systems or gantry feeders and stackers that are pick and place and they they're, they're designed for a job. They're designed to feed an edge bander or feed a boring machine or, or unload a panel saw. Um, they have a specific task and they have a specific field of travel and that field of travel or that area of, of, of working is defined when the machine is designed. Whereas robotic or soft automation is more flexible and you can take a robot from one job and move it to another job and redefine its path or redefine the end of arm tooling uh, which is the, the vacuum effector or whatever is, is designed to pick up the device or do the job it's doing. And then you can have a new application. So I'm going to start off with hard, hard automation and use examples of what you see out here in the show. So flexible storage systems. Uh, flexible storage systems are systems that you put varied panels of into, different colors, different thicknesses, different uh, uh, types, MDF, particle board plywood, high pressure laminate clad plywood, constructions can even be uh, composite panels. And you store them and you provide them to a machine on a demand basis. So instead of having a physical rack storage that you've got to go to and pull a panel out, these things deliver an essentially, not instantaneously, but very quick within 30 seconds, the panel to the machine. So the idea with these type of systems is to keep the machine running more of the day. So if you think about a panel saw, and if it's a front load panel saw, then you've got to bring a unit to it. If you change colors or change material types, you have to create that rainbow stack away from the, the machine or do it during the day. So your saw operator is not running the saw 85% of the day, but 55 or 45% of the day. So the, that's where the ROI comes in on this type of technology. In this type of technology, you have three types of stacks or configurations, what we, what we call a homogeneous stack, a rainbow stack, and a chaotic stack. So a homogeneous stack is clear what it is. It's all the same material type. And in these systems, these stacks can be 80 inches high. So if a three quarter inch panel basis, that's 100 pieces of, of that stock. And you, you, without uh, runners between, you can get pretty dense, uh, can, dense dent, uh, you can get a good density of panels in the system. <clears throat> Rainbow stacks are ordered stacks where I've got three reds, two blues, uh, etc. in a certain order and if I need the, the red 
my, you hardly see my corner there, but you see it right there. So if I need that, I've got to dig out the ones on top, put them somewhere else, and then get the rest. So there's a cost of management in a rainbow stack. Then you have the chaotic stack, which the system manages. So it's essentially random. We dig down far enough to get what we need. We look, we do a Pareto analysis across the whole inventory schedule, and we say we use, you know, 80% these 10 colors and 20% these 40 colors. So I'll do chaotic stacks in these 40 colors. And those, so then it's a probability uh, analysis to see how often I pick that up and, and get it for the machine as to, as to how long that takes. And I can also pre-stack so I can get ready to get the next panel while the machine is working. So this gives you a typical layout of what a system might look like. And here you've got color codes. These can be wood grains. They can be pictures of uh, the, the veneer uh, to give the operator a good understanding of what the stack is. And it's just like, you know, it, it's a, uh, <coughs> your, your user interface that within one glance they can hover over each of the stacks. Like this one is a uh, blended or chaotic stack. It's got a multicolors in it. You hover over it and you see exactly what's in that stack. In a system like this, you're typically downloading an order to the machine. And that order on the machine, or that order gives the, the machine the process order of, I'm gonna run three, three quarter, melamine two sides, then I'm gonna run two, birch plywood, UV fill, uh, et cetera. <coughs> We also define some priorities within these machines. So if you have two machines in the work envelope, if you visit our booth, uh, you'll see a saw and you'll see a CNC machine in our envelope. And of course, for the show, we have a very small one, but it's ex it would be expanded when it'll be sold or installed to a customer. Uh, <clears throat> but they, you've got a priority of movement and you have basically three jobs in that storage system. I have to provide panels for the saw I have to provide panels for the CNC. We have a labeling device in there, so I have to provide the panel to the CNC, the, the labeling device first, if, that, if labels are called for. And I've got to restore, or I've got to replace the panels that I consume during the day. So the priority number one could be the panel saw. You can assign this. The priority number two could be the CNC. And the priority number three is restoring from the supply side. So if I've got free time and I'm the machine, then I'll go and do priority number three when I don't have any demand immediately for the two machines. But if, as soon as I get a demand signal that the panel saw, the cycle time is 4.5 minutes, say, say, and at 3.5 minutes, I'll get a signal that says, I need to get this panel to the saw so that it doesn't go down waiting for a panel. And even if I'm on a trip to get a restore, I'll stop and, you know, and I'll go get that panel. So that's the kind of logic that are built into these type of machines. And they're based on space priority as well as productivity priority. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go too much into the detail. Uh, there's some, some uh, concepts of how automatic restoring works and rotation index. You do want to, to, you know, first, you know, inventory first in, first out, or first in, last out. This, generally these systems, what's on top is consumed. So if you, until you reverse the stack, you could have panels in the bottom of the stack for a long time. So, and, and that could give you problems in the long run if they're uh, like plywood or some fancy face veneers or something that you have some moisture take up over time. So you have to control that. And we can put priority indexes or sorting indexes that will dig out those panels at night and place them on the top so they can be consumed. Taking or tacking we call it, but uh, basically it is preparing a stack to go out of the system. So let's say I've got a storage system and that storage system is feeding only one CNC and I've got an old beam saw that I couldn't put in the envelope because it was built in 19, 1998 or something or 2002, but I wanna prepare a stacks for it. I can do that, I can do that at night and I go there in the morning and there's my rainbow stack and I pick that up and I take it to the machine. So that's providing a, a rainbow stack outside of the system for consumption somewhere else. So <clears throat> we also manage what we call uh, offcut or external offcut. So you always have drops in a nest or a, a, a cutting uh, optimization. And drops are the, the hardest thing to manage in any business because you set them aside because you don't want to throw them away because they're worth something, but you don't know what they're worth because you haven't consumed them yet or you haven't applied them to a new job. The other thing it costs you is counting 
as inventory, if you inventory these things every month or every six months, and you have to move them around. So it's best if you manage that, and some of the optimization programs out there manage that. Uh, we manage it as well according to the fact if we label it. So typically we set rules up with a customer that if we have, if we can, out of a four by eight panel, we're gonna consume half of it or less than half, we'll make a drop cut and we'll take that four by four panel and we'll save it. We don't save everything, but we save things that are useful that we can easily manage in some type of vertical uh, storage system. And <clears throat> so we'll call back in the next optimization. One thing about, I'll, I'll speak this, the one thing that's the, about this system is if you do consume something, and today most, ha most shops are just in a way, in a habit of putting all this stuff in the corner and you, you damage a panel and you go over and grab it and you use it. Well, you've gotta let the system know to make something like this work. So you barcode in, barcode out the system so that, that, that the software knows that you've consumed it. Sir. So the, the, the question is, uh, can, you know, how do you manage multiple vendors with a storage system like this? And the answer is that, that if we want this type of control, then we have to be managing the software. Or if we're working with our partner, Cabinet Vision, or another partner, I just throw them out, you know, it could be Microvellum, it could be uh, another design software. If they have that module, then typically they take that responsibility. Okay. I <coughs> We use an SQ, SQL database format for storing our data. Uh, you have access to look at that, but you don't have access to write to it. I, so how do you, these things get dimensioned? I, you've got the storage systems, you go out in the show and you see all types, small ones, big ones. I, they're not just you buy the size that fits. You have to study your consumption of product and you have to study your demand. And then you have to see, you know, <clears throat> does there, is there an ROI with investing in this type of technology? So typically, and I'm gonna walk through an example, but you know, I wanna talk about the two main integrations are CNC machines and, and panel saws. Uh, they could be a laminator, we, we've done lines like that as well, but generally those are the two main uh, integrations. And here we just to give you an idea of different versions of a storage system are based on speed, they're based on footprint, uh, typically, if they get over 100 feet, we go to a higher speed. That's 100 feet in length. Uh, <clears throat> and different levels of machinery, okay? Meaning, you can buy a smaller panel saw or you can buy an angular panel saw. Uh, the storage system can feed all these different levels of machines. Or you can buy a multi-table router or a single table router. Okay, so here's a, a cell with a CNC coming out the front and a angular, excuse me, a uh, beam saw, where's my cursor? And you see it's got an in-feed storage table. So if you're book cutting and you do an analysis of your, your uh, process and you do a lot of book cutting, like two and three sheets, then you don't wanna buy a beam saw that you have to put the panel in front of the pusher because you're gonna be waiting on that system to replenish the second and third stack of that book or panel of the book. You wanna build that book in mass time so you don't stop the machine. If you're doing a lot of single sheet cutting, which probably most of you are in the sense of running kitchen at a time or job at a time, then loading in front of the pusher beam is not a big detriment to the cycle and the total productivity of the system. But these are the kind of things that you study to understand what to recommend. So here in this machine, we're preparing the book while the machine is working. And then when the book is ready, it comes forward, the grippers come back, you've lost only the exchange time of the gripper position and you're off and cutting again. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you a video and you have to keep be my timekeeper. So it's 15 minutes and, and we're over at 10 o'clock or 10.30? I think it's 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, okay, so I just wanna make sure I, I don't run out of time. And I'm gonna kinda of run through the, this, this video fast. This is a storage system feeding a panel saw. 
and it's a rear load, it's, a, uh, it's got the uh, uh, accumulation table and it's got barcoding. So <clears throat> we're labeling, here we're, we're loading directly from the source stack. So this application is, we can load here. This was early in this machine's installation, so we don't have a full inventory system right now uh, within the storage, but we're loading directly from the stack and we're book cutting. So <clears throat> as we're labeling, the machine can be cutting and we can be getting the next panel. And after we label the first panel, then we'll put another panel on top of that and build a book. This particular customer is a cabinet manufacturer. They're, uh, they produce only what they sell. They're just in time. They produce cabinet and kitchen at a time. So backs being the most variable aspect of their product line, they're around 350 cases a day. And backs vary both in height and width, whereas end panels vary mainly in, in uh, width, excuse me, in height. We, we needed a flexible system, and we also needed to be able to build books uh, as well as single sheets. So that's what we're doing. You look at the end of arm tooling here on the storage system, it's got three different types of vacuum cups on it. So these cups are used to separate the type of panel that we're picking up. If we're picking up quarter inch, <coughs> we need to flex it so that the inrush of air below it doesn't disturb the panel. We're picking up MDF, which is, you know, you could pull a vacuum through MDF. That's what we do on nesting machines, right? We pull a vacuum through it. We call that transpiration. If we have that happening, we could pick up three pieces of MDF at a time. We don't want that to happen. That's a bad thing in a storage system. So you need to be able to stop, measure, weigh, make sure you only have one panel. If uh, We have a vacuum cup that actually exhausts in the center and sucks on the outside so that we blow off the panel below while holding on the panel on top. So all these devices are built into the technology to do this job. So here you see that the, now we can start building the new pack. We're pushing up a pack of panels for our uh, pusher beam. <clears throat> and that system will come down. It'll go up and straighten the pack. The pack is pretty straight, but we need to make sure it's uh, perfectly straight. So when we do a trim cut, we know we, uh, we trim all the panels. And, and we're often cutting. So let me go through this a little bit further. And so a after this is done, okay, so let's watch this section right here. So this is the perfect exchange. It doesn't always happen this way but you've done your last, maybe it's a third phase cut. This machine has a dual gripper, so we've got uh, both uh, uh, axes on the gripper. Then machine comes back, gets the new pack, continues running. So now you understand the difference between loading in front of the beam and loading a pack behind the beam. If I had to load those four panels in front of the beam, I would have to wait that whole time that they're labeled and loaded. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so different types of, of configurations. Here's a storage system with a uh, single beam saw loading in front because this customer is going to do a lot of single sheet cutting, uh, maybe 20% dual sheet uh, or two sheet. Here's a storage system with a CNC machine uh, that's uh, got an in feed roller on it uh, as well. There's a little dot right there, and a labeling system and the entry point is in the back. The entry point can be on any side of these things. So we, typically you, you need to know how the factory is situated to, uh, to, to make a proposal even to begin with. Here's a storage system with two saws in it. Here's one with a saw and a CNC. So generally how does a project work? Uh, you know, you go, you've got some layout. Typically the layouts that I get from customers are not AutoCAD, they're, uh, from the original blueprint of the factory and someone sketched in some of the machines that they have, okay? And we, we make a discussion and we see how it works. And then this is typically what comes back. You make a layout of the factory, you uh, dimension the storage system to what you think is appropriate for the customer. Uh, you provide you know, a good flow. Uh, you won't flow into and out of the factory. This customer brings his panels in. Here's a die. There we go, sorry. So they bring their panels in right here. Uh, they've got a blind wall here. This was their source of uh, uh, electricity. This was, that was the back wall, so we had to be clear of that by four feet or five feet. So 
we bring the panels in, we've got the loading position here, the panel saw, and the system goes out. So this customer has a CNC, we put that against the far wall, so now their, their flow is like this. And they've got good, uh, uh, good, good flow for the factory. You take a look, so typically if you're working with a, a vendor of this type of technology, they should be asking you these kind of questions. They should say, give me your consumption for a month or two months, not just for a week or a couple days or an answer like, I use all 50 panels a day. Now you need to know what the consumption is and you need to analyze it. And you need to say, okay, what are my high runners? So you know, everybody knows Excel and pivot tables and we look at the consumption over time and we look over, then this particular customer, they wanted to understand what they stock versus what they buy by job. Because so many jobs are custom order and you have some configuration of panels that you're never gonna run again, so you buy that for the job. Typically in that case, you would load from, you directly load the machine from the loading position. There's no need to go into the inventory to come back out to the machine. You've got the unit from your uh, panel supplier. So the stock items we did a Pareto analysis for and we came up with this 10 stock positions to satisfy that daily consumption. And this is what the analysis could typically looks like. So you've got, uh, you know, at, at basically 55%, 57% uh, were the top seven panels. When you get to 90% or 80%, you've got basically, what is that number? Say 20 panels, or 20 panel types. This is another configuration for a factory that we did for a customer. And this is a good, you know, uh, sir, your, your question was how do we deal with some uh, other machine brands? They had an old Thermwood in this case, so here it is. And I can't put that machine in the storage system, it's not feasible. So we provide stack solutions to that. So here, the storage system can provide a stack to either one of these machines, the panel saw which was existing, the th uh, CNC router which was existing, and then a new router that's suited for placement into a machine with labeling was placed here. So we accommodate the technology that's there as well as adding new technology to the cell. And then we do an analysis of flow and, and, and try to get good flow through the factory to the assembly area. So I, I use this, uh, SNH cabinets uh, uh, okayed me to use this in this presentation. They're a customer of ours, they're on the west coast. Uh, they're a commercial cabinet shop and they bought a, uh, uh, a storage system and I did an ROI for them based on that. And here the, uh, the numbers are basically they bought a new saw and a storage system. So the new saw was 90 grand, the storage system is 220, round numbers, the in total investment is 310. So we wanted to compare storage, no storage, they're gonna buy a saw either way, right? So in this particular case, we look at the, uh, the capital cost. Of course, the capital cost is, is quite a bit higher because you're borrowing a lot more money. Uh, we look at the term of the investment over five years. We look at uh, the labor cost savings. We made some assumptions in labor cost savings uh, that, that uh, the, the owner was com comfortable with. We look at the space savings, the space took up for the uh, line, the, the potential for injury pre prevention. Uh, all these things go into the analysis. And we calculated that the customer should have around a two year, over a two year payback in this particular case. I, and I think that this customer would not disagree with those numbers I, from the point of view of, of his experience with the investment. And it wasn't a particularly large storage system. So, and then, then I think this, this company is in the, maybe the eight to 10 million range in, in revenue. So that's, enough, uh, that's all what I have on storage systems. Any questions on that before I move into robotics? It's a good budget. I mean, I've, I've quoted these things from 190 to 400,000. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's very dependent on the number of machines and the size, but yeah, it's a good round, a quarter million is a round number. Sir. If you had to pick one or two metrics that would indicate that a shop is ready to go to that metric, would it be sheets per day, would it be spots per day, what would be? You know, it would be sheets per day. Uh, so the capacity on the one for the router is 100 sheets per day. That's right. Well, the router, CNC router, 100 sheets is really up there. Uh, you know, your average CNC router cycle time is uh, between seven and nine minutes, okay? Generally speaking, could be up to 12 minutes, can be as low as four minutes. So, you know, at, at seven minutes, um, you know, you're, you're, you're 
consumption on, on that number is around 70, 60 sheets a day. You don't have to be maxed out, but if you're hauling around and cutting 40 sheets a day, you need to look at how that individual's time that's managing that rainbow or getting that inventory supply, what you're replacing. And if you can get more uptime on the router, so you have to look at that. I don't think there's a pat answer. No. So I, we had a robotic seminar, and so I took this presentation from that seminar that we did about three months ago. I, and this cell that we have here in the show is quite similar to this, so you're welcome to come visit that, but I'm gonna base the, the, uh, this presentation on this, this particular uh, uh, seminar. So we have here showing no flex door on this seminar, but we have a flex door on the floor. We've got a CNC router, okay? We've got a robot unloading to carts, unloading to a mobile industrial uh, cart. Uh, we've got an edge bander, and we've got a return system. Then we have a Borendal outside of the cell, and we have a robot feeding that, and we have a case clamp, and we have a robot gluing the panels. And we have all this on display here at the show as well. So uh, <clears throat> we're using a Kawasaki robot. It's a, a six-axis, uh, 130-kilogram payload robot. This is a heavy-duty industrial robot. Robots generally are judged in mean time between failure or hours between failure. And robots uh, have <laughs> excellent service histories or service uh, capacity. Uh, you know, you think about the woodworking industry, I wish our machines, all our machines were, you know, 20,000 hours mean time between failure. These are the kind of numbers that robots hit. So this is not by any stretch of the imagination the weak link of any system. The robot itself is a very proven and resilient and robust technology. And Kawasaki, Fanuc, KUKA, there's a lot of brands out there and they're all excellent uh, uh, tools. Typically, vendors choose robots not so much based on their, capacity, their operating capacity, although that's part of the equation. Um, it's their familiarity with the software and how they integrate with it and how that software integrates with their machine tool, um, et cetera because you, you put a, quite a bit of investment in the software side of this installation. So what we're showing here is a robot with a very sophisticated end of arm tool, which is this device right here, that can not only pick up and place parts of different sizes and, and uh, configurations with holes in the parts, without holes, but also to feed a machine. And to feed a machine is a totally different level than to just pick something up and move it to another location. Because to feed a machine, I've got to have accuracies of around four thousandths of an inch. To pick something up and move it, I have to have accuracies of around fifty thousandths of an inch. All right, it's, it's not nearly as as, as uh, dependent. So this gives you an overview of the, the of the line of robots, different types, ca payloads, capacities, uh, collaborative versus industrial. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. I, I wanted to show you just some different applications, maybe beyond what we normally do in uh, the cabinet world. Uh, this robot is uh, uh, picking up barrels and putting them into a flame burner that uh, uh, is flaming the interior of the, of the barrel for whiskey production. This robot is uh, spraying, and you see a lot of this application on the floor, spraying uh, uh, different uh, part configurations. And these robots are equipped with vision systems, so they see what's coming down the line, they direct their tool path, they uh, make sure that they don't overspray or underspray any aspect of the object that they're looking at. They, they're typically looking in 3D at these objects. Yes, sir. Spraying robots, meaning explosion proof, are significantly more expensive? They are more expensive. I, I can't give you a, a price differential, but it's just not the robot, it's the entire spray booth. It's how to get, because when you go to a robot, you now have safety issues that you have to manage around the, the object of the robot itself as well, and that's part of the explosion. So yes, they are more though. I, <clears throat> here's a robot that's uh, uh, managing uh, uh, parts for a machine. A palletizing robots, you see that a lot. Palletizing robots are typically five axis robots. They're, they don't have the six, six axis. Can't say that fast three times. 
Here's a collaborative robot, and, and a collaborative robot means that you do not have to have the same level of safety protection for that robot that you do for an industrial robot. Typically, that's defined by the speed of operation, the work envelope, and how, that, how much uh, uh, capacity does that robot have. The collaborative robots typically work either with a, some type of tactile detection, sens sensory detection around the robot, or force detection. And force detection meaning if the robot's moving and someone gets in its way and it, it stops, then it knows that certain force is required, it will stop before it'll plow through it. An industrial robot would cut you in half and it wouldn't even know it, okay? So that's why an industrial robot has fixed guarding around it that has to meet, a, meet a certain OSHA level versus a collaborative robot moving slower with less force does not have to have that. We're at halfway. Okay, thank you. Sir, uh, what's the dimension scale of the 10 kilograms. So we're showing a collaborative robot with a little bore and dowel machine. So think about a bore and dowel machine. It's a pretty redundant task. Uh, it's not really rewarding to run that machine all day. Typically, those machines, if you match that to a CNC and you've got one CNC and one bore and dowel machine, that bore and dowel machine is probably at 45% capacity, 50% capacity. It doesn't run all day to, mac, to make all the parts that that CNC makes for your cabinets. So our idea was showing this at the show was to show a robot that uh, can be fed uh, uh, during the day in, in, uh, at certain times whenever the operator has some parts to put in it. So instead of tending that machine 55 or 50 or 45% of the day, it's tending 10%, walking over, depositing some parts, walking away. And we, this robot is equipped with sensors, and we'll talk about that in a minute, that detect when a person is close so that it slows down. So we have that level of protection, but you can walk all the way around that robot, you can touch that robot, it will stop if you touch it, you go back to reset it, it starts working again. So it doesn't have the safety requirement that the typical industrial robot does. And it's doing a, a mundane, repetitive task. Here we have a robot showing gluing, and that gluing is gluing the end panel uh, along with someone building panels for a case clamp. And this is also a collaborative robot. Collaborative robots can be uh, placed in, in all types of environments, can assist, have operators working right next to them, and can assist certain, func certain processes that are redundant. So you have a case clamp and you want to, uh, and you spread hot melt around your back to lock the back in uh, while it's in the clamp. It's a pretty redundant task. So you could have the, the collaborative robot do that job and equip it with a, uh, a pistol to, you know, dispense the hot melt. So let's talk about. Go ahead. So typically, if you're using an automated clamp, the clamp is already e equipped with some level of um, part detection. Like, uh, and I know I'm not supposed to talk about our products too much, but our clamp has um, automatic sensing for the size of the product. So once it's clamped on the product, it didn't have to know what you put in there, but once it has it, then our clamp knows that size and it could feed that information to the robot. And within 0.5 millimeter or millimeter, the robot will push with a force sensor and follow the beat, follow the corner. So automated guided, autonomous guided vehicles, you know, everyone knows an AGV, all right? An automated guided vehicle. Typically fires a wire path in the floor. Autonomous vehicles, or mobile industrial robots as they, they, they're known as, do not have any type of guide system in the floor. They're totally GPS uh, driven. Uh, they're also, uh, they, they, and beyond, beyond that, they also map the room. So they have a map of the room and they know what the room is and they know the physical objects and they know the objects that are floating in the room are meaning that they're, they're not stationary, they're not fixed. And they are meant to work with people in their environment. So we have two of these in our booth running around, actually three, one giving water away to everybody and uh, not the two working in the cell. So these things uh, can go around objects if their, object, if their path is blocked. So before the show, we mapped our booth. We mapped the boundaries of it. We said, you can't go out here in the hallway. You stay in our booth. And these are fixed 
locations, here's the machine, here's the machine, and your job is to go from point A to point B, and if someone's in your way, you go around them, and that's what it does. And it finds the ultimate destination, uh, uh, depending on you know, what's in its way. And these things are used everywhere. If you go, I've, I've, Amazon I've, has a video, if you've ever seen it, where they've got these special devices carrying uh, uh, basically vertical racks around, something like that rack right there, but really tall, with multiple objects on. And these things go and get these objects to packers, and they're just moving around like, like spiders. You look like an ant colony. And they're moving around everywhere, bringing par objects to someone to fulfill an order for or order for fulfillment that are packed by people because of the object type. <coughs> So some of the specs, they come in 100 kilogram uh, or 200 kilogram payloads. Uh, they're relatively precise. You can device, you can give them sensors that make them even more precise uh, for as far as location. Or we have docking stations for them. And we've got a docking station, the one we're using in the booth. So it's, when it's in the robot cell, it's very precisely located because the robot needs to know exactly where it is to place the parts. Uh, they're equipped with fleet software. These SICK detectors, uh, we've got these on both the unit, the MIR, as well as on our mobile, on our collaborative robot uh, cell with the Bore and Dow machine. And they can be programmed for uh, field of depth as well as uh, the late safety level within that field of depth. So if you're within four feet, the machine's doing normal, ro no, normal movement, but it knows that you're there. If you're within three feet, it slows down. If you're within one foot, it stops. And you can have these things, you, know, you can deploy multiple robots. Uh, typically, you would deploy mul multiple robots in an application. So in our cell, I, and I'm going to go to, hard, uh, to uh, industrial robots. I, we have uh, a robot set up at the end for, uh, I, excuse me, here. Uh, Where's my little dot? Anyway, at the front of the line, that's unloading the, the nesting machine and loading an edge bander as well as stacking the carts. And how does the robot know what to do? So there's two schools of thought in that, and that is one, you could map your nest as it comes out of your optimization package and feed that information to your robot and you would know where it is on this. But you know, these nests, are, they don't come out pristine of the machine. They get disturbed, sometimes they're a little bit warped. Sometimes, I, meaning the panels warp. Sometimes I, I, there's a piece, a toe kick when you're cutting it, maybe it comes loose and it kicks the part next to it as it's unloaded. So we chose not to use the, the uh, optimization method or the, the, the depend on where it is method because that's less flexible. We use a, 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 a 2D scan, 2D label that contains a unique uh, ID for that part, and we use a database for the tra for the tracking of that part. Then we have a camera that's mounted on the bottom of the end of our tooling, uh, and, and camera technology is unbelievable today. I, we read with no problem the uh, I, 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 the barcode. We have also uh, the barcode can be torn; it can be damaged. You've got about forty percent redundancy in these labels, so you've got a lot of room for error, and still read the label. And then that that database contains all the process steps for that part and where it ultimately ends up, what card it goes on, et cetera. And then we have an end of arm tool that's, that's quite sophisticated. It has uh, what we call compliance. So compliance is exactly the same thing that you do when you load your edge vendor. You push the part against the fence till you have some resistance, then you push it into the machine, kind of trying to emulate the same speed of the chain track as the part takes off into the machine. So for a robot to do that, it, and it has no, I, I, it, well, for us to emulate what a person does, then we've got to know the force it takes to push against the fence, and we have to measure that force so that we know when to stop, so we don't push the fence out of the way, because a robot's a strong device. Uh, we then have to match the speed of the uh, bander. And that's all within the, the, the normal capacity of a robot, and also our end of arm tool. So we have compliance in the x-axis, in the y-axis, and the rotational axis as well. And we also have brakes, so once we reach that point of compliance, we brake it like you, do, like you would do your, your, your object in your hand, and you push it into the machine, and that's what the robot does. 
So here we're loading uh, carts and, and unloading the machine. I, how am I doing on time? Oh, you got about 20. Okay, so I think we've, uh, we can play this video. So this, is, I'm going to kind of buzz through this. This is the labeling aspect, uh, the machine loading the, uh, the panel uh, onto the deck. Now we're labeling the next panel while that, that panel is uh, loaded. Uh, <clears throat> different machines have different positioning systems. This machine uh, has a two-step positioning, so it laterally forces against the back fence, so uh, we know where the panel is. Of course, we're CNC uh, drilling and routing. Uh, pretty you know standard technology today the storage system so the cal you mean calibration is in thickness, thickness? yeah we we struggle with that We're so we, we, we have a touch off on this machine uh, that we touch the panel and we can calibrate it and we also have a tool touch off because in Lights out manufacturing, you need to know that the tool's not broken for those to make sure the robot, when he goes to pick up, that the parts are truly separated. See, see how that part come out? It's not perfectly uh, uh, pristine, but it's a good, you know, it's a good exit of, of parts. Here we're taking the picture. That's how long it takes to figure out what those parts are and where they go. And so the robot does a quick optimization, and it says priority one is edge banding, and priority two is uh, bore and dowel in this particular cell. We have a bore and dowel machine and an edge bander. And here at the end of the line, for capacity reasons, we actually showed two robots, one for returning the part and one for stacking. And the one we've got on display here at the show, uh, we've only got one robot in the cell. So that's a good question. We, the robot does not check if the edge band has failed or not. The, uh, that's the job of the edge bander. And the edge bander can be equipped with detection to make sure that the part is good. Uh, and then stop the process, or you depend on the fact that the edge bander is going to give you repeatable product. So in this case, we're showing a single side edge bander that was not prepared for uh, robot loading. It's a standard machine. There are other machines that you can do things to them to make them more robust for the application. If you think about the, the machine in your shop that has the most challenges, it's a nice way to say that you, you, <laughs> you could have issues with it, is the edge bander. I mean, for sure. And so a 20 year old edge or a 10 year old edge bander, don't put a robot on it because you're gonna be challenged. You're not gonna be happy, all right? You need a very reliable, very robust bander to do that job. You don't have to put a bander in the line. We show that. You could also put a, just a boring down a, a stacking system in the line. So that movement right there, is exactly what the operator does. Pushes against the fence, holds it against the fence, and then loads. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna cut this and go to another video. And here, uh, I'm just gonna show, I'm gonna turn it down a little bit. So here we're showing uh, loading a uh, unloading a, m a machine and loading with a standard return conveyor. Um, and this we can also equip the edge bender with devices that facilitate faster loading of the machine. So the average robot cycle to load an edge bender is around 12 seconds. So you say, well, that's only five edges a minute. My operator can load faster than that. So I. Uh, and it's, it's true, he can. The operator can load probably eight to 10 cycles a minute. So we can equip the bander, but the price goes up, with devices that make that machine able to load at more closely to an operator's rate. But in any payback of any machine installation or any calculation, you figure the tack time. And if you, have, if you satisfy the ultimate tack time, which is related to sales, then the process capacity, if it's there to support that, whether it's 12 seconds or eight seconds, it's really not relative, uh, germane until you decide, I want a better attack time, okay?
scale that so so that? that's a great qu question <laughs> matt because we get that a lot and ultimately you're not going to program the robot uh, you could a collaborative robot because they have a pretty easy and pendant interface but industrial robot i um, we have special high, high level um, IT people do that level of work, okay? But once that cycle is programmed, it's programmed in a very robust manner, the job it's that sit there to do, it does it. And you have ways to recover from errors if you have a part move or to come dislodge, that kind of thing. Um, so you don't program the cycle. Um, we set that up and then you, just like your CNC, you don't program all what's in the background, you just program what it does how it cuts it. How it does it, though, there are built of a huge PLC functions. So. so I wanted to show you this little collaborative robot. This is the case where we're uh, picking up and uh, loading and unloading standard dowel parts all right, into a dowel machine. And we've got this on display as well. <clears throat> we're sensing the width and the lengths because uh, here we're not reading the label. We, you can put any part that fits within the size register of the cell here. And I manage that. Now I want to stop that right there. So here I'm using, that's, that's exactly what I'm going to address. I, since we're not using a label, we're using a parametric program, which is the same program that matches what's designed in engineering. So in, I'll use cabinet vision as a gen generic uh, uh, CAD package. Cam, CAD CAM as well as design package. So you've got design criteria. The first dowel is 30 millimeters off the front edge. Follow with 32, follow with 64 or 96, depending on the width of the panel, blah, blah, blah. So that conditional statement that you've defined because it's normal that you do that is the same thing that's defined in that machine. So we've made the process simpler and more robust by uh, not reading the label in this particular case, but having the machine measure the part We've also uh, made the end of arm tooling super simple, okay? It's a vacuum bar with two sensors and a force detector. There's no compliance in it. It measures to a force. I have now on the table of the CNC, of the Boren Dow machine, the ability to measure the part to when it's in its zero, zero. And it's not an on off, it's actually a positional measurement so that I know that my part is within two thousandths of the fence on left and back and I'm ready to go. And that's the same thing the operator does, push it to the corner and push the button to go. When it goes to the corner, the machine starts. So I think you answered the question, you're going to take the same parametric formula that I have in the engineering software and just put it in my machine. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. So you see a little black thing push back, that's the back sensor and the side sensor. So in this particular case, if you wanted to go out and buy a UR10, which you could do, uh, they're not that expensive, they're 40 grand, uh, develop the technology to do that, you could do this job as well. This is a pendant interface. This robot is meant to be programmed by a, a typical um, CNC type level programmer. That robot's 40 grand? Yes. And 10 was the payload capacity? 10 kilograms, that's correct. Oh, and, you know, if we sold that, we would sell it with a complete package, it would be more than that. But if you just went out and bought it, you could get a quote on that, 40, 45, something like that. Do you see them coming along as interchangeable heads where I'm not gluing oh. parts today? Oh, there's a, the, uh, they're, they're, that already, that exists. That technology of coupling and decoupling of heads with sensory uh, attachment. Uh, you go to Schmaltz booth, you can buy it off the floor. It's here. Sorry, y'all. Okay. Getting down, to Getting down. Okay, I got 10 minutes, okay? So I'll talk fast. So ROI, uh, we talked about that on the Flex Store. Um, you know, but this was a spoof we did on our, our general manager. That's the uh, uh, president of SCM. And of course, he likes a photo op of the robots. But that's not why you really buy them at the end of the day. You buy them because there's an ROI there. And, you know, we, we talked about this. Uh, the investment in ourselves, just say it's a million bucks. Okay, and so you compare that million to what all those machines would cost without the robots. You, that's a valid comparison because you don't compare it to what you're doing today. If you're going to make an investment in CNC, you compare the CNC versus the CNC with unloading. 
And that difference in this particular case is around half a million bucks. And after I run the numbers, I, and that's always up to debate how we manage that, but uh, you know, you run the numbers, you get 45 months. Well, you know, that's a four year payback. Is that reasonable? Well, I think it is. Only because that's a four year payback that keeps on paying for the next 20 years, okay? Now, robots are difficult to get ROI'd if you're using a two year system in almost any situation for single shift basis. But when you go to multi-shift or you know, second shift over time, all of a sudden the ROI starts looking really good. Uh, and what everybody at manufacturer does in capacity balancing is that they run overtime when things are busy because they don't want to hire. But if you had a robot there that could take some of that ebb and flow out, then you're not paying that overtime at that point. And all these ROIs are based on standard time, carrying costs of an individual at 45,000 bucks a year. Okay, so you see that that one's 47 minutes. If I uh, size down just the investment uh, with, of the robot with the, the unloading only, here's the collaborative uh, investment. They're all based on one shift. They're all based on one shift. Yes, they're all based on one shift, five year payback, 4% interest rate, which may be a little low. I have 49 months. And <clears throat> This is the collaborative. Uh, this was 30 months. Uh, but this assumes that you get a certain capacity gain out of the gluing station. So you've got to be able to do a certain number of cabinets a day for this. Uh, so any, any questions? Um, I'm specifically interested in buttons with a collaborative robot. Who should I talk to? So come to our booth. And, and uh, uh, we actually... <laughs> We're, we're very, very close to bringing a, a sanding buffing application. And you know, there's only so many things you can do in a show and resources and everything going along with that. Uh, buffing, there are people out there that are buffing today uh, with the collaborative robot. Yeah, you showed that. Yes. Uh, secret cabinet. That's right, yeah. that's exactly right. That's exactly what I think my situation is. Like okay. Right, do final touch up, right. Any other question, you, Matt? Yeah, and I don't know if it's a question or a statement, but I mean, some of the common issues we run in our shop are edge banding the wrong side, doweling the wrong side. When we kit our boxes, things get mixed up and misplaced. I mean, what have you seen for changes? I mean, we're about a $2 million a year shop. Is anybody that small able to step into this yet, or is it just not quite scaled to that? So I have had no customer that size by a robot. Uh, the robot applications we're working on are generally with 15 to 20 million plus uh, uh, companies. Not to say that you couldn't look at doing that. I, you know, dialing the wrong side or, or edge banding, you know, that, those kind or of labeling it wrong. Labeling it, it wrong. Wrong label on the wrong so part leads to all these things. The robot doesn't make the mistake as long as the label is right. The biggest challenge in a robotic application is coding the right label and coding everything to where it works perfect. So many of our companies run based on a tribal knowledge undercurrent that stuff is good enough, it gets out, but maybe the data is not 100% or there's been an engineering change and no one's reflected it, but they know what to do and the stuff comes out to the end of the line and it works. But when you go here, everything has to be right, meaning all the engineering drawings, the engineering drawings, they need to be clean, the, uh, the banding has to be clean, et cetera. And then you don't have the errors. I mean, that's kind of our thing is technology amplifies right. our, our weak points, I guess. And so we're looking for what can we do to prepare for this? I mean, it might not be this year. It might be three to five years out, but we're just trying to work on our systems. So hone the engineering side is what I would say. Thank yes, sir. I got this. What's the quality control or what's So uh, what's, nothing is checking the piece to make sure it's a good piece, to answer that question, okay? I, 
so you can do vision to do that. We're using vision only for the detection of the label. Uh, vision takes time, and there's a cost of fixing that part that moved on the table uh, versus trying to detect that part. That part's, uh, it, the cost to detect that curve or that bad part will probably exceed the benefit of detecting it and rather just finding out when the, uh, the, the, the band doesn't stick and you have to remake it. So what we did to solve the problem of how to remake something is that uh, if, if, if there is a bad product that comes out somewhere in the process, on the nesting machine, on the edge bander, we have to remake that part. We have a screen that allows you, also you drop the part and it's damaged, you, you break the corner, et cetera. So for a lot of reasons, you need to remake parts. We have a, a system of creating a label for a part, we remake it, we cut it, puts the person throws up a piece on the CNC, we don't bring it out of the storage system at that point, and the robot sees that part. That's why we went to the vision of identifying the label. That part can be in any configuration. Throw it up on the belt, and it comes out, the robot picks it up and processes it. Sir, a uh, question over here. Yeah. Yeah, and we're trying to figure out. We don't have automatic labeling. It doesn't seem like it's something you can really baby step into. It seems like if you really want to have the gain, you have to really go big or go home. It's hard to piece together. I mean, I like the idea of putting the stacks, pulling them out, and putting them on existing machinery. You know, it's it's a couple million bucks is a big pill to swallow sometimes. And we've always just said, oh, we'll get this, and the next. Remember, year we'll that's get that. all the machines too. So, yeah. okay, a couple more. In a perfect world, could one label once your parts are um, stickered or your label is put out, most likely after it's received, the parts are put on the CNC. That one label could go through. You know, would you say one label could get it through all the robots that we saw? Oh Yo, yes, it does. The even the gluing application that that you'll see. There's a barcode scanner, and the, op, the person scans it, and the machine and the robot runs it. Absolutely, it's a unique ID, uh, very similar to what these cabinet design packages assign, a unique code number for that part uh, through its life in the factory. So the raw material that we saw in the beginning, um, that was, those also are labeled so they can be labeled after everything, right? So the panels generally don't have labels. Uh, we don't label them until we're actually using them. We know where that panel is and we know what uh, uh, position it is in the stack. Okay. So one more question. Um, am I correct that on the, on the storage, on the whole storage, you said something in the neighborhood of a, it's a quarter million dollar kind of mindset. Yes, sir. Right. What's the same comparable kind of number about a robot? So the robot that we have on the end of uh, uh, the line, the Kawasaki K KG-130, or 30, 130 kilogram, uh, five, six axis robot is around 200,000. The, ro the arm itself is probably 80 to 90, but the integration and everything else that goes with it pushes that number up significantly. That's a good number, yeah. Yes, sir. That's correct. So I want to thank everybody for coming today. I want to thank CMA for uh, letting me uh, address the crowd, and I, I hope you found it worthwhile. Thank you.